This week on the Lectures in History podcast, a lecture about Christian nightlife in the 1970s. This lesson focuses on evangelical nightlife and Christian nightclubs in California. It's taught by California State University Fullerton professor Eric Gonzaba. He also shares his own personal anecdotes and experiences throughout the lesson. Thank you all. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hello uh, to my class. Hello to the American Studies Department here at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, hello to mom and dad if they're watching at home. I love you very much. Um, I am honored to get to speak here today uh, to my American Nightlife students. Um, and also, this event is doubling as uh, the uh, Fall 2022 Grad Faculty Colloquium in the American Studies Department here at Cal State Fullerton. It's a tradition here uh, in the American Studies Department uh, for faculty to talk about some of their present research and to talk about some of the research strategies that we have perhaps some of our research foibles as well. Um, and as you can see from my opening slide, I've already given away um, the, what my talk is actually going to be about today, which is Christian nightclubs in California. And I know there are a couple of you out there probably think those two words do not belong together, uh, Christians and nightclubs. Uh, but since I prepared about an hour's worth of remarks today, I am confident to say those, do, those words belong together at least one time um, in American history. And so I want to talk about that a little bit today. Before I begin, um, this is a week 12 in, uh, for my American Nightlife students. And um, the American Nightlife is a course that I developed in the last couple of years here at Cal State Fullerton. And this class challenges uh, my students to change our timelines and to place evening at the center of our analysis as scholars. What our class asks, we can we learn about understanding America's nocturnal attitudes. And while nightlife often conjures up uh, associations with pleasure and escape from everyday life, uh, my students really dig into how night and nightlife has long been contested, filled with work and play and identity formation and plenty of pain and controversy that can tell us more about American history and American culture. For example, in week two, my student Noriko Astroy explore, explored how modern Philadelphia college students used, uh, quote her words, strategic behaviors in an effort to impress uh, potential romantic and sexual partners while partying in the city of brotherly love. Um, during week three, my student Sean Anderson dug into how British American aristocrats in the colonial era went to so-called lower class taverns that was frequented by women and Native Americans and enslaved African Americans to, quote, assert their power and masculinity over those they deemed wildly inferior. And by week eight, my, my student Sully Sylvester wrote of the coming of 19th century gaslighting in Baltimore and across the country and other cities. And in his words, how American leaders and urban elites used lighting and policing in an effort to tame the night. And while in just past, this past last week, my student Nadine Bachter just uh, explained how the dreams of Civil War soldiers in the early 1860s, which in her, her words, they shared freely and honestly with their loved ones through their letters and revealed their soldiers' fears of being forgotten, replaced, cheated on, imprisoned, and killed. So this course, as I hope I, can, I, I have already proved to you, deals with spaces and activities and attitudes about how Americans in the evening hours understood their way of life. And today I want to discuss a space that many Americans do not know anything about. And, and to do that, I want to start off with a story. I'm a historian at heart, and I always tell my students, I want to begin with stories. And so I want to take us about 40 miles east of here um, to the city of Los Angeles. This is not the venue I'm talking about. This is actually a very f uh, famous venue on the Sunset Strip called the Whiskey Ago. Go. But imagine this is another venue um, on the Sunset Strip. Um, 50 years ago, actually in, in 1971, on a warm Saturday evening, an orderly queue began to form just after 8.30 p.m. in front of a music venue near Beverly Hills, California. At first glance, there seemed nothing remarkable about this space at all. It sat on the Sunset Strip, a new, nearly two-mile stretch of road infamous for 1960s rowdy nightclubs, bars, and restaurants. It also sat on Sunset Boulevard, an area of the city that Los Angeles rocker Arthur Lee once described as a psychedelic movie in technicolor. But unlike the typical clientele of other music clubs on the street, right, those in line at this nightclub seemed very, very different than the other revelers walking around the Sunset Strip at that time. These folks at this nightclub were, had neatly presented hair, neatly presented attire. They looked, according to the LA Times, who was witnessing this line, they, they looked like a mother's dream or Orange County safe. <laughs> hmm. The neon marquee above their, uh, their head also felt very out of place on the Sunset Strip. Instead of marketing the newest up-and-coming rock musician, psychedelic rock musician, um, the, this marquee above their heads read, the Jesus movement is he here. 
Now, these patrons were not waiting for a Friday night filled with booze and dancing to psychedelic rock. Instead, they were in line for a show at the brand new rock club on the Sunset Strip, L.A.'s first Christian nightclub. Now, since this is a colloquium, which I'm very excited to, to present at today, I get to talk about kind of my, what brought me to this research um, in the first place. And I, my, the origin of my, this research project on Christian nightclubs goes back to when I was in graduate school at George Mason University. And at the time, I was writing a dissertation. I actually completed a dissertation on gay male nightlife since 1970. And that should actually, I should make clear to everyone, studying uh, Christianity or the religious right is not something uh, that I'm an expert in. Um, but I want to tell you how I started thinking about this kind of project about Christian and nightclubs. While I was doing photographic research to try to find images of gay men at bars and bathhouses and cinemas and whatnot, um, I was constantly on the hunt to try to find images of these men in the actual places that I was writing about. And during this time, I came across two images that had nothing to do with gay bars in the 1970s, but I found them. I kind of was stopped in my place, and I I read the caption. So you're actually looking at these images the way I found them. I didn't find them, the way they were presented to me. And I wanted to actually hear from you all. What do you all think when you guys see these images, especially my students? You just explained to me, let's do some image analysis together for as a class. What do we see in this first image um, of a Christian nightclub right on in Los, a- Los Angeles in 1971? Let's hear it from a student. Yes, one second. We're going to bring the boom mic to you if that's okay. <laughs> what do you see? Um, the first thing I see is like the posters that are on the back of the wall. One of them says, you have a lot to live, and then I assume it says Jesus. Yeah, and then okay. Yeah, and then the other one is just... I think it also says Jesus. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna, it's safe to say that it does say Jesus. Oh, nice. So, like, kind of um, portraying like the messages that they want to have oh. in this nightclub. So, so uh, posters on the wall, and they have the word Jesus on them. I like that. Other other ideas. What do we see over here? Let's do in the front here. I see sodas instead of alcohol for the refreshments. Oh, yeah, so you're looking at the menu here. We have spiritual food was free, hot dogs only 50 cents. You could not get that at Dodger Stadium today, right? Um, Cokes and 7-Up and ginger something, right? Very good. What else do we see? So I had some more hands up over here. How about over here? Our last one, yeah. Very similar to Soli's, but my question was, what is spiritual food? <laughs> um, and is hot dogs and strawberry shortcake spiritual? Like, is there a reason why those uh, are spiritual? Know. That's a great okay. question. Right? We also see people playing pool, uh, a man and a woman. We're looking at interesting, I think, like late 60s, early 70s dress. We know this is 71, so the caption gives some things away. What about this next photo? What do we see? <laughs> Same bar, right? Someone's reading a newspaper. Stoked in, uh, stoked something, stoked in Jesus. How do these people feel about their nightclub experience? Does it, does it sound like what the LA Times is writing about it? Orange County safe? Maybe. Anyone want to guess my favorite part of this image? I, I, I needed to know more about this one person. Yes. Is it the gal in the back? Oh, look at her. Very, <laughs> very excited to be at a Christian nightclub in the 1970s. Right. Very good. What drew me to these photographs, both of these, is not actually, I mean, I was astounded that there was Christian nightclubs, so I was like, that's interesting, but I think I expected to see a whole bunch of people with, like, clasped hands. I thought I would see a whole bunch of people maybe, you know, like, looking up to the air. I'm thinking of, like, stereotypical images of what I think about evangelicals, right? But I don't see that, and these photographs seem, at least to me, remarkably normal, right? They could be a dive bar in my hometown of Indiana, in in Indiana, right? Now, it goes without saying that the concept of... um, uh, Christian nightclubs intrigued me after seeing these photograph, photographs, mostly because I think, I held, like I said, I held fairly stereotypical images and ideas about evangelical Christians in my head. Plus, at the time, I was writing this dissertation about you know, gay male communities across the United States, and certainly many gay and lesbian people in the late 60s and the early 70s saw evangelical Christianity as antithetical or even downright hostile to the interest of gay people. And in newfound neighborhoods across the United States, a whole new sort of of culture was being formed by and for gays themselves. And for me, at least, and the, re- the research that I'm doing for my dissertation for this book that I'm writing, the biggest symbol of that blossoming and burgeoning, com- burgeoning community and culture were nightlife spaces. Bars and bathhouses and cinemas represented a culture of pleasure and sexual exploration that was long denied to thousands and thousands of gays that before they flocked to these urban centers. 
All this is to say, I thought this was super strange looking at these images, right? It was it, at the exact same time that gay liber- the gay liberation movement was really taking hold in cities across the United States, in San Francisco, in New York, in Houston, in Chicago, best symbolized by the increasing number of gay bars across the United States. So too was another social movement rising, one that often seemed in direct opposition to gay freedom, and that was evangelical Christianity and later the Christian right, right? And this movement too was using at least showing some evidence of using nightlife as a way of projecting its message. And I needed to know more. And thus this project um, was born, and now I'm forcing you all to hear some of my earliest findings about that, right? (laughs) So today I want to talk about how beginning in the early 1970s, entrepreneurs in California and across the nation began opening up Christian nightclubs. In my early research, I dive into church newsletters and directories, mainstream news articles, phone books, college newspapers, and photographs um, to tr- and identify seven different Christian nightclubs in, here in California um, that, are, that form the focus of my analysis today. These, lo- these nightclubs were located in Los Angeles, in Long Beach, Newport Beach, Orange, and a few in Northern California as well. Now, those that started California's Christian nightclubs, I call them entrepreneurs in my analysis today, hope to not just profit off an emerging Christian uh, marketplace, but also to reclaim a secular space as well, here deviant nightlife spaces. And they wanted to transform them into clean venues. This is their words, clean venues, spaces to find joy and have fun in the company of fellow followers of Christ. And these entrepreneurs also believe that these Christian nightclubs could be helpful sites of evangelism. If non-Christians could not be reached from a traditional house of worship on Sunday mornings, they theorized that evening music venues could help bring them to the Christian flock. And so Christian nightclubs may seem like just another extension of Christian Americans hoping to create religious versions of secular entertainment, right? Similar to Christian theme parks or music festivals or museums or summer camps, right? However, I want to argue today that Christian entrepreneurs believe that nightclubs could also serve a special function that's a little bit different than other Christianized spaces. Nightclubs, they saw, might reach non-Christian teenagers and especially adults who found other Christian spaces, spaces as too stuffy or too evangelistic or too churchy. They also hoped that nightclubs um, could break the stereotype of religious spaces as being anti-fun, as a way to keep Christians devoted to God at all hours of the day, not just on Sunday mornings. And these new religious nightclubs were special to so many Christians, I argue today, precisely because they were not churches, and very few of them were ever directly affiliated with churches. Christian nightlife owners reasoned that their clubs and their secular feel of these clubs, often with incredible dance floors, state-of-the-art sound and lighting systems, might make Christians seem hip and cool for the first time, they reasoned. And finally, these Christian nightclubs were experiments in how Christians might envision evening pleasure. It was inside evangelical bars where Christians could explore the meaning of friendship, of leisure, and romance in a Christian context and build an evening community without drugs and alcohol. But I want to give some context before I jump into these awesome bars that I've been uh, researching of late. So first, some context about the period that lead up to the 1970s. And I really want to argue the 1970s is pivotal to why Christian nightclubs at least start beginning in the 1970s. So the birth of the Christian nightclub begins in the 70s, and it coincides to a period that many scholars call the Third Great Awakening, where uh, historian Edward Berkowitz says people are finding God in record numbers and in odd places. I don't think Berkowitz is even thinking about nightclubs when he's saying that. Now, I want to point out this third great awakening that's happening in the beginning in the 1970s is not even across all denominations in the United States. Um, uh, So-called liberal Protestant denominations, uh, denominations like Methodists and Presbyterians and Episcopalians, they actually see a decline in membership roles um, in the uh, the post-Second World War period. We're talking about 20 to 30 percent decline in these denominations. But the membership roles for evangelical and fundamentalist denominations are surging by the 1970s, with new evangelical movements prospering in the forms of megachurches and parachurch networks, um, such as the Willow Creek Congregation um, and the Calvary Chapel Movement, which I'll talk about in a second. 
By 1978, one study suggests that nearly a quarter of Americans identify as evangelical. Ten years later, Gallup is going to suggest in the, in the late 1980s, Gallup is going to suggest that um, one in three Americans either call themselves born again or evangelical Christians. So certainly by 1970, evangelical Christianity has gripped the entire nation, right? And California is pivotal to that surge, right? Pivotal to that evangelical explosion. In the post-war era, California's population grows rapidly in large part from migration of Americans from the Bible Belt South across to the West, with many of them settling here in Southern California. It's known for its you know, beautiful temperate climate and for its rising middle-class suburban prosperity. By 1969, the state of California by itself has more people, more citizens that were born in the South than the entire state of Arkansas does, right? And it's also not just Southern California that has a religious awakening. Northern California um, in, in, in and around San Jose, uh, the San Jose Mercury Times says that um, Northern California is witnessing a new religious awakening, right? So California is a big part of this evangelical explosion. Now, another way that evangelical Christianity based in California becomes so popular by the early 70s is, was through a belief among many Christians down here that Christianity can be more fully ingrained into the daily life and culture of Americans, not some strange ritualistic activity that only takes place on the weekends. One example of this is the Jesus movement that began in Southern California in the 1960s. Uh, the Reverend Chuck Smith models his church after the hippie counterculture movement that many young people are, are a part of in the late 60s. Um, instead of uh, embracing psychedelic drugs and free love, however, Smith encourages his followers, who later call themselves radical Christians or Jesus freaks, to come barefoot to his church and accept an informal loving relationship with God. And this church becomes super super, super popular with young people and also adults, even in middle class Orange County um, because of its informal kind of California style. The church embraces things like folk music, um, lively Bible session. Uh, Smith does large baptism on California's most gorgeous beaches over here, right? In 1965, a Smith's church just has about 25 members. By 1978, what is that, 12 years later, right? Um, or 13 years later, um, uh, Smith's Church in Costa Mesa has 25,000 people attending it, right? So we're talking about a mega movement here. Now, this mushrooming of the evangelical community in California led by Christian entrepreneurs to envision what they called a total Christian community and infrastructure network. By the 1970s, evangelicals across the United States began thinking that their faith ought not be confined to Sunday church service, but to all facets of life. They created Christian senior homes, Christian banks, Christian auto shops, Christian uh, beauty shops, Christian medical office, and they also embraced pleasure institutions. Um, evangelicals created Christian dude ranches out west, Christian radio programs, TV programs, Christian summer camps, Christian bookstores, Christian, Christian amusement parks, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, the head of the PTL television network, create a theme park out in South Carolina in 1978 called Heritage USA. Um, Jim Baker's hero is Walt Disney. He wants to, he outwardly calls, I want to create a Christian version of Disneyland. And he, uh, Heritage USA in South Carolina becomes the third most successful amusement park, most attended amusement park in the 1970s and 1980s, only behind Disney World out in Florida and, of course, Disneyland here in Orange County. I just love looking at his maps here. Here is, um, here is uh, a picture of Heritage USA, the map of Heritage USA. Here's a map of Disneyland the exact same year. You can see um, Jim Baker is taking a lot of inspiration about what he wants uh, a pleasure community for Christians to look like, right? And Jim Baker's religious theme park has um, a Jerusalem amphitheater, Christian stores, Christian cafeterias, and a massive, massive water park. Now, to kind of give you um, an example, and this is a lot of text, I apologize. I promise I won't talk about every single one of these things. But I want to read you uh, what a social theorist, Jeremy Rifkin, um, kind of imagines how uh, many Christians understand the ideal life in the day of a 1970s Christian family. 
In the morning, husband and wife wake up to an evangelical service on their local Christian-owned and operated radio station. Let's keep track of how many Christian uh, places these, this family goes to, right? The husband leaves for work while he will start off his day at a businessman's prayer breakfast. The evangelical wife bustles the children off to a Christian day school. At mid-morning, she relaxes in front of a t- TV set and turns on her favorite Christian soap opera. Later in the afternoon, while the Christian husband is attending a Christian business seminar and the children are engaged in after-school Christian sports programs, the Christian wife is doing her daily shopping at a Christian store, recommended by her in a Christian business directory. In the evening, the Christian family watches a Christian world news on television and then settles down for dinner. After dinner, the children begin their Christian school assignments. A Christian babysitter arrives. She is part of the babysitter pool from the local church. After changing into their evening clothes, the Christian wife applies a touch of Christian makeup, and they're off to a ding, 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 Christian nightclub for some socializing with Christian friends from the local church. They return home later in the evening and catch the last half hour of the 700 Club, the evangelical Johnny Carson. The Christian wife ends her day reading a chapter or two from uh, Marble Morgan's best-selling book, The Total Woman. Meanwhile, her husband leafs through a copy of Inspiration Magazine, the evangelical Newsweek, before they both retire for the evening. You guys get what I'm trying to get at, right? (laughs) Um, Now, while evangelicals embrace this new form of uh, Christian infrastructure across the country, many, many remain skeptical of recreating institutions that they saw were particularly connected to sin and vice. And that includes nightlife sites, sites, right? One of the most famous people who questions whether or not nightlife sites, especially secular nightlife sites, should exist is a a minister called uh, Arthur Blessed, a Southern Baptist minister. And he spends his late 60s walking across the Sunset Boulevard with a gigantic cross and because he thinks he's going to evangelize people who work in the nightlife industry, people like barmaids and bartenders, um, go-go boys, uh, strippers on the coast, right, uh, sex workers, band members. And Blessed even, even secures permission from local bars to enter these nightlife spaces to evangelize during their off hours, right? Not only does Blessed think that people who work inside the nightlife uh, um, establishments uh, need to be uh, evangelized too, even the people who go to them need to be evangelized too. Um, so here, though, what's interesting about Blessed, Blessed says, like, man, if only – I actually don't think that nightlife is necessarily wrong. I think people who go there and what the activities they do inside them are maybe are problematic. But Blessed says, like, it'd be, it'd be kind of cool one day to actually maybe have a Christian nightclub. And little does Blessed know that in a couple of years he's going en- to enter a, a Christian nightclub on the Sunset Strip called Right On, Right? Now, Christian entrepreneurs had no idea if their experiments creating Christian nightclubs would actually work. But with so many other evangelical businessmen remaking formerly secular daytime spaces, they felt that like nightclubs might offer another route to reimagine a Christian fellowship at night. But I still want to point out that many, many people are, are really skeptical of this. Remember, uh, Arthur Bless is telling people, don't drop acid in the Sunset Strip. Drop Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus is the a- everlasting high, right? And even into the 1980s, after many of these nightclubs, Christian nightclubs, have come and gone, there are still Christians, prominent evangelical Christians, who fear secular nightlife. One of those people is Jim Baker, who will start the PTL uh, network, the one who starts Heritage USA that theme park. In in the middle of the 1980s, he's going to raise money to build what he calls a partner center um, at uh, Heritage USA. And he tells people that this partner center is going to be able to evangelize at all hours of the day. People who are coming to Heritage USA and and they wake up at 2 in the morning and they're tempted by drugs, they're tempted by alcohol, they're tempted by uh, sex, they're going to be able to come and pray at all hours of the day. Because he says there's plenty of entertainment for secular people to do that. Let's watch his campaign to raise money a little bit for this um, for this uh, partner center and see what he says about secular nightlife. Give me one second. Meeting rooms there for individual meetings and workshops. And then right in behind that will be a new 5,000 seat auditorium to be able to minister to the people that have come to Heritage USA. We're always out of space, but we believe this is going to take the greatest step forward to give us space. You know, to fulfill this scripture, to gather together, the devil has really done more for fellowship for his crowd than God's people have done for God's people to fellowship together. 
The enemy has built a fellowship hall in big cities on every corner called a bar. In the middle of the night, you can go down and find a bartender to talk to you. But how many churches are open in the middle of the night? How many Christian centers are open in the middle of the night? You know. But the bars are there. The devil has places all over. He has gambling casinos. He has uh, nightclubs, theaters, places for the world to fellowship. God says, I want my people to come together. And we've been intimidated by the world. The world says, stay in your churches. Don't come out. And God says, I want you to come out and get together. I want you to love one another. I want you to get on fire for me in the last days. Okay, but that's Baker's understanding, right? But many people, including Christian entrepreneurs, are going to try to reach people at night by using a mechanism that secular people are gathering at night, which are nightclubs, right? But as Baker's warning tells us, religious nightclub owners that wanted to Christianize nightlife spaces had to find a balance of both promoting Christian fellowship on one hand while also keeping nightlife space principally as a site of fun and leisure, a.k.a. have a fun bar space but keep it Christian, keep it clean, right? Now, in the next couple, maybe 30 minutes or so, I want to kind of give you kind of a how-to guide to build a Christian nightclub, right? Um, and I want to figure out how did these Christian businessmen actually start Christian nightclubs. And I want to look at uh, the way uh, evangel- what evangelical nightlife spaces can tell us more about the desire for that total Christian community, that total Christian nightclub um, experience. Now, one interesting thing I found during my research into these seven nightclubs is that despite connections with already existing uh, Christian networks, I'm thinking things like Christian coffee houses and whatnot, few Christian nightclubs actually are born either as independent places that someone just uh, finds an empty storefront and opens up a, a Christian nightclub or convert a former Christian like coffee house into a nightclub. That doesn't that rarely happens. Most of the Christian nightclubs that I'm going to talk about today were actually reclaimed, reconverted former secular bars, right? Bars that used to serve uh, alcohol, that had smoking, that had, you know, scantily clad women occasionally, which we're going to see in a second. And that was actually the point of these spaces. One of the ways to, for Christian businessmen to actually show that their place is fun and hip is taking over a formerly secular a nightlife spot. Um, as one of the nightclub owners that I talk about here, uh, or excuse me, not one of the nightclub owners, one of the people who used to tour nightclubs uh, acts, uh, said, like born-again Christians, the nightclubs that I go to, these Christian nightclubs, have undergone a conversion experience. Uh, for instance, how Rupert transforms a, har- a former hard rock uh, discotheque space into a Christian nightclub called The Basement in Orange, California in 1976. The next year, Brian McLean is going to convert The Daisy, which is a very, very hip... Um, 1960s nightclub, a very for ritzy celebrities in the 1960s. You can see here, this is before its conversion on Rodeo Drive. It's a private nightclub. We know this because we have um, evidence of uh, their membership card showing us that's a private nightclub. He's going to turn this into a Christian nightclub smack dad in the middle of Rodeo Drive in the middle of Los Angeles. These are not nightclubs on the corner and the outskirts of the city where people have to trouble finding them. You can easily find a Christian nightlife spot. It's pretty prominent in major areas of the country, right? And to be sure, not all Christian nightclubs could afford to rent out places for the entire week, right? Renting was always an option just for certain days of the week. For instance, Jason Ross leased out a dive bar, a pretty famous dive bar now, um, but he re- leased this out in 1986, a place called Maverick's Flat Grill, um, and he, he rented it out for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights, and he called this, uh, this new bar uh, Praises. And unlike the gritty saloon atmosphere that, that was common at the tavern Monday through Thursday, um, um, uh, excuse me, Monday through Friday, on the weekend, praises was free as what he said, choking smoke, sultry fashions, and the slur- slurred speech common at secular bars. But for me, the most interesting of these converted spots is not just a normal tavern. It is 
strip clubs, right? Just how committed are Christians to nightclub owners to the idea of Christianizing secular spaces? Well, let me just say, even strip, strip clubs were not out of the question. Now, I know the far left images of Texas, but it's one of the earlier nightclubs in here. Um, I just think it's so interesting that San Antonio uh, Christians convert a former burlesque house um, into the, gold, the Green Gate Club, a Christian nightclub that used to, before its conversion, uh, show nightly strip shows and burlesque uh, acts um, before it converted in 1960. 71. Now, right on, the very, very first nightclub we talked about was formerly a go-go bar, and it called itself a strip palace in the 1960s, even welcoming famous burlesque stars like the anatomic bomb uh, Lily Sashir to perform before its Christian conversion. And when the Central Park Disco opened in Merced in Northern California, I don't have to tell you that it didn't originally open up as a Christian nightclub because the, its most popular entertainment were male go-go boys who danced over over hundreds of revelers on their many dance floors. Open displays of sexual pleasure, of course, were certainly not acceptable at Christian nightclubs. But I wanted to return to the 1970s and talk about why the 1970s is so important here. The 1970s is so important to the rise of Christian nightclubs because uh, it is the disco era, the rise of the disco era. Now, the nation in the 1970s, and in fact, the world in the 1970s, succumbed to what we know as disco fever. Here's a cover of Newsweek in 1971, an image of Donna Summer proclaiming that disco takes over, right? And though prominent disco clubs in major cities like in New York City and in, in Studio 54 often become synonymous with drugs and sex and, 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 and other things like that, disco actually was a diverse genre. Many, many people enjoy disco music. I know we know there's a backlash to disco by the late 70s and early 80s. 80s, but at first, most people think that it's one of those uh, genres that can unite Americans across age lines, across gender lines, across racial lines. Um, as, the, as the Billboard writer uh, Bill Wardlow notes, there were in the 70s teen discos, even kiddie discos with soft drinks, even senior citizen discos, he says. The music, according to the Billboard magazine, didn't divide parents and children as previous popular music did. Now, disco music helped usher in folks into Christian nightclubs, especially since some Christian owners spent extravagant amounts of money um, investing into dance floors, sound systems, and, of course, lighting, right? In 1976, even before disco's rise, the basement in orange included a glistening uh, paquet dance floor complete with a revolving disco ball overhead and beautiful ultraviolet lights that shined across a large dancing section that was not uncommon um, at secular nightclubs. But listen to this. Owner Hal Rupert of the basement um, invested $20,000 in his sound system. He'll invest another $35,000 in his sounding lighting system in another Christian nightclub called Noah's Ark in Long Beach in 1976, just as disco is blossoming across the country. Up north, Bob Campbell, when he converts the Central Park Disco um, in Merced, he likely keeps much of the investments he made in his previous go-go male go-go boy uh, club, 11,000 square feet of dancing space, 24 speakers with state-of-the-art earthquake horns, 32,000 watts of lighting, $60,000 worth of sound equipment. And I really like this. This is Praises Now Nightclub about why they spend so much money on these uh, Christian nightclubs. I like this quote, what he says. He says, we wanted to push back against the idea that Christian means styrofoam cups and poor sound and lighting. What do we think he means by this? What do we, what do we get from that quote? What does that mean? We want to fight. We're going to spend so much money on these clubs to fight back against the idea that Christian means styrofoam cups. I guess they don't have hydroflasks back then. But <laughs> what's they mean by that? Yes, over here. I think what he's trying to point out is like this idea that these Christian nightclubs are taking place in like a Christian, like a church community center or like the basement and that Christianity can be cool and elegant and upbeat and keep up with these same nightclubs. So you're not just going to come here and get some kind of like thrown together, you know, church moms event, but you're <laughs> actually going to get a full experience like you would in any other nightclub but Christ Center. A hundred percent, right? Exactly what we're having. Even in the 1980s, Christian nightclubs hoped to be seen as hip and cool, right? Um, the fact that disco was um, that a disco was Christian did not mean necessarily that it was any less had any less quality of sound, any less cool of an experience inside, right? Your dance floor experience could be equal to that at Studio 54, perhaps. Maybe that that cool, but pretty cool, right? <laughs> now, what about music? 
uh, a good question that we all have, right? What sort of tunes are being played at Christian nightclubs, right? Or I talked about disco, but even before disco, right? Now, disco music at, at uh, Christian nightclubs was, was sometimes live, but more often um, they, uh, there was recordings via a jukebox or mo- more likely a DJ being played, right? And nightclub owners admitted that initially in the early 1970s, they had hoped that Christians, excuse me, excuse, Christian patrons actually, would dance to Christian music, right? But they, can't, they, had, uh, they didn't really have a lot of danceable Christian music in the early 1970s. Um, they often thought gospel music, especially African-American gospel music, um, they, they thought, they, according to them, had good beats. Um, but for some reason, they couldn't get their patrons out on the dance floor um, to dance for them. This is a song, uh, I gave my students an article about some of the early, uh, the Right On nightclub, actually. This is a song that was playing at the Right On nightclub at the night that we all waited in, in the queue. I want you guys to tell me what's wrong with this song and about getting people to the dance floor. Let's put it on. This is, uh, excuse me, this is the... Um, uh, uh, the Oak Ridge boy singing a song called Jesus Christ, What a Man. I'm not going to all of just a couple of seconds. Yes. Just speak loud. We don't have to. Just sounds like a lullaby. It sounds like a little bit of lullaby. Why is that a problem? Add in like karaoke. It almost sounds like you're singing Tennessee whiskey at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, a, is that a problem? <laughs> to get people to dance, yes. Very good, right? We're not, we're not having very lively music here. Perhaps that's why our friend at the beginning of the Right On, night, not, right on night Club is kind of falling asleep in her arm right at the beginning, right? Not the most active music. But by the disco era, uh, we, we have ways of fixing that. Also, gospel music becomes a lot more disco-y by the late 1970s. This is a song by Betty Griffin, just to give you an example about how Christian music becomes really, really danceable by the 1970s. This is Betty Griffin singing Free Spirit. Tell me how different some of you shazamming the song back there it's okay it's okay you'll you'll be able to see it all right so yeah so the music gets better it gets more danceable right people want to dance by the disco era and makes sense that so many of these clubs become much more active there are more nightclubs by the late 1970s and the early 1980s than there were at the late 60s or the early 1970s but we have a problem especially if these bars are going to play mainstream disco music and want to guess what that problem might be yeah um establishing that it's not Establishing that it is meant to be Christian and it means it's meant to have God imbued in it. Right, yeah, certainly, yeah. A lot of disco music has very explicit lyrics, right? It's about sexuality, it's about, you know, uh, maybe, cur- I, I don't know, right? But it has like, explicit lyrics in a way that some of these clubs are not comfortable playing with. There's a couple solutions, right? Some of these nightclub DJs are going to uh, edit out explicit lyrics, which is not that uh, uncommon, right? Pop music still does that to this day. Um, some of them, though, disco has a lot, a lot of music coming out that is lyric lists, right? So it's just the beat. I'm thinking like almost like the, the hustle, or the only, the only lyric in the hustle is the word, the words, the hustle, right? Um, so that is, can be can, can kind of understood as Christian, right? One way to get around it. So censored lyrics or looking for lyricless music might be super helpful. And with, by, in the, by the disco era, with this new incessant disco beat booming through state-of-the-art sound systems um, at, adult, uh, at adult Christian nightclubs, these Christian clubbers could um, 
uh, overtake several dance floors. At Noah's Ark, uh, adults could take over one of the dance floors, and there was three other ones for younger people, teenagers, young adults. There's not one, uh, often one dance floor at major uh, Christian nightclubs. There's often multiple ones, and they're often segment- segmented by age, right? So older people don't feel like they're constantly dancing with younger people. Kind of an ingenious way of getting uh, these Christian nightclubs uh, to not feel like they're co- constantly having to be in contact with people across um, the age boundaries. Now, what about fashion? Now, uh, for, for our class, for my American nightlife class, um, dress and costumes and uniforms have been a constant discussion topics in our course. But I think it's important to, to understand what the LA Times means when they call um, the people who are standing in line at the right on in early 1971, Orange County safe, right? Um, by looking at a few photographs uh, that we have of a, some of these Christian nightclubs, and you'll see me searching for more of these uh, Christian nightclub photographs in a second, I've come to see that Christian nightclubs kind of embraced a sort, some more uh, a conservative dress than was often found at other secular nightlife, right? In an effort to keep their disco clubs clean, some Christian nightclub owners enforced dress codes. For instance, at the basement in Orange, in order to keep a clean atmosphere, um, the bar owners banned uh, tank tops, they banned shorts, and they banned sandals. Jesus Christ himself could not go to the basement, <laughs> right? Uh, Now, more conservative dress was a staple at Christian discos, even at clubs that didn't explicitly ban certain clothing. And I'm just looking at, I'm using, basing this off of just what I'm seeing in some of these uh, photographs here. And by the way, I can't be guaranteed, these are often press photographs, I can't guarantee that these photographs are not staged for the camera. And as as scholars, we should be very suspect of photographic evidence, right, that can constantly be staged or manipulated. But I think, like, even if these were staged by nightclub owners, it's it's example that, um, that entrepreneurs wanted the clientele of their Christian nightclubs to to outwardly appear stylish and yet modest as well. Now, disco represented still, there was still a lot of people who did not like that Christians were embracing disco music or dis- disco nightclubs, right? Disco represents to many Christians perversions of secular society. Um, and prominent evangelical leaders often equated disco music and discos themselves uh, with the so-called decline of the American family, oftentimes in the same sentence as, uh, as them um, being annoyed with the rise of homosexual culture or rampant abortion, right? For instance, Jerry Falwell in the spring of 19. 19- 1979, in the middle of, um, uh, by the way, Jerry Falwell was a TV evangelist, but in the middle of Jimmy Carter's reelection campaign, uh, Jerry Falwell comes out on television lambasting Jimmy Carter, but also lists the other things that's wrong with the Carter administration and Carter culture. Homosexuality is wrong, pornography, television comedies, abortion, discos, divorce, and sex education. Uh, anti-gay um, Anita, a campaigner, Anita Bryant, who ran around the country trying to overturn pro-gay rights laws across the country. She sent out a newsletter in 1979, the same year that Jerry Falwell spoke about uh, Jimmy Carter, warning readers that gays were producing disco records with double meanings and then having straight children by them. And even disco stars like Donna Summer and Gloria Gaynor, both who will convert um, to evangelical Christianity later on, Donna Summer is going to come out in the late 1970s and early 80s and, and urge gays to, quote, change their ways. So the popularity of fundamentalist Christianity surged in the later 20th century United States, even among celebrities of the disco eras. Not only were disco's floors gateways to ungodly activity to these people, but the music they played might be an unnecessary temptation to sin, even if some Christian nightclub owners took time to censor lyrics. Now, Christian California nightclub owners were keenly aware of this controversy. For instance, um, when Noah's Ark management switched their music from gospel to disco, they found out, according to one of their owners, said, we found out a lot more of our conservative Christian patrons were turned off. Um, and uh, to, uh, to Santa Ana's Calvary Church leader, um, Sam Talbert, he says, discos are actually worldly institution, institutions. They originate in bars. And so naturally, my reaction to Christian discos is going to be negative, he says, right? But it's not just the music or disco culture that is um, widely viewed, that, that irks so many Christians. Any form of dancing was controversial in some fundamentalist circles. In fact, according to some Christian nightclub owners, half of the Christian world doesn't believe in dancing. Most of the reason is culturally induced and not from the Bible. But we believe the Bible is full of dancing. 
Now, Protestant Christians have long been divided about whether da- dancing is a sin. I, I don't know exactly why. I'm still researching why that is. But I did find an excerpt in an old newspaper by an Oklahoma Southern Baptist minister, Jesse Gaskin, who wrote – this is him lambasting ballet, of all things. He says, ballet is a vulgar display of nudity that appeals to the cheap-minded admirer, right? But by the, the start of the 1970s, some evangelical leaders start banning dancing at up-and-coming uh, Christian institutions. The most interesting one I found is uh, our friend Reverend uh, Jerry Falwell earlier. He's going to try to convert uh, many people, college students, into Christianity. He's going to found Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia in 1971. And when he does, he writes a student handbook. And what's one of the rules in the student handbook? It bans social dancing. Right? And it's punishable by a fine. If you're caught at a, a club, even a Christian nightclub, you could have to pay a certain fine. By the way, that fine still exists. I just looked it up this morning. I think the fine for t- attending a dance is $15 now um, in, in 2022. And by the way, some Southern California Christian universities copy Liberty University's model, including universities like Southern California College, now Vanguard University in Costa Mesa, Biola University in La Miranda, Azusa Pacific University, Westmont College, Evangel Point, Loma, and San Diego. They copy this, right? Despite the ban, though, Christian college students, including many of these who go to these schools here in Southern California, are flocking to Christian nightclubs. And thus, many Christian entrepreneurs want to keep opening these spaces these spaces, but they're mindful that many uh, Christian institutions are worried about dancing. For example, when Ray Swanland and Shel Wilkinson want to open up a Southern California nightclub, they go around to Christian churches, Baptist churches and whatnot, and they ask them, like, can we have your metaphoric blessing uh, to open up our Christian nightclubs? And they kind of get, like, a gray response, and and some of them say, sure, open it up. So they do open it up. They open up a, a nightclub in Newport Beach called The Lighthouse in 1985, and it survives for many, many years. There's some claims in some newspapers that it is the largest nightclub in Orange County in the middle of the 1980s. I can't confirm that, but it's interesting if that's true, right? And um, many college students go to that, including students who are going to these universities, right? They're violating their own college's bans on going to social dancing, right? Uh, many of these students, for instance, that go to the Lighthouse go to Vanguard University, what was then called Southern California College, and they would write to their local administrators at the school, like, can, we, can I stop like, having to meet at hiding every time I want to go out uh, and dance at a Christian nightclub? Of all places, I'm not going to a, a, you know, a secular disco. I'm going to a Christian nightclub. Why is that a problem? And the university does not budge. Um, and I even found this. Um, by the way, I want to point out, it's kind of risky to go. One, you have to pay for some fines. But all of these universities, if they catch students at these dances, if, they're, if someone squeals on them, for, for example, um, they often receive letters from their university that tell them that they're at risk of losing tuition money or scholarship money or uh, financial aid if they keep going. They even risk expulsion from the university if they keep um, infringing on the social dancing policy. And many students are upset. They're writing to the local newspapers how silly this is. Um, and so I wanted to actually get the student reaction to this dancing ban. And so luckily, many of these universities have full runs of their student newspapers digitized online. So I went um, and looked up Southern California College's reaction to students uh, going to social dances at the Christian nightclub, The Lighthouse. And I actually find, I found at a student newspaper a campus security blotter that kind of stopped me in my tracks. And I want you guys to read it with me. Resident directors Chris Ramsey and Diana Priest submitted names of people rounded up at the Lighthouse, one. Among those hauled away from the Christian nightclub and sent to their rooms were Jerry Stinger, Ron Luna, Todd Robinson, Doug Healy, Steve Sparks, and Dave Woodworth, along with the entire sixth floor of the Women's Tower. Now, I was like, whoa, I have like some awesome, I couldn't wait to write about this. I was going to like, I was going to be so excited. But then I stopped for a second. I was like, hmm, we are good scholars in this room, right? What's the thing I should do before I start writing an awesome piece about how Christian universities are rounding up people? I should probably like read other parts of the security blotter, right? So I looked up and down. This is a, a part of the security blotter on March 27th. Two male students were reprimanded for a scuffle at the salad bar in the dining commons during lunch. The dispute was over right to the last dip of house dressing. Campus security verified the reason for the brawl. It was casserole day. Also reported by the cafeteria staff were five students, name was held, who took more than one helping of a main course on their first trip through the lunch line. No arrests have been made of date. And then, lest you think this casserole drama is over, five persons were arrested by Costa police and turned over to campus security on suspicion of driving under the influence, very serious, right, of dangerous substances. Blood test of the five suspects revealing traces of firemen's casserole in their bodies, which was believed to have been the cause of erratic behavior. Um, 
the driver of the vehicle will not be formally charged until the cafeteria can be absolved of blame. So what is this a classic example of? Satire. Satire. Very good. Parody here, right? So good thing I did not write a whole, like, Twitter thread about how horrific these colleges and universities were, right? But eventually, these students actually make inroads with their university complaining about the dancing ban. And in 1985, after so many different letters uh, about how there are Christian nightclubs now, we should change this policy, SCC students convinced the board to amend, to qualify uh, 0.6 of the Statement of Responsibilities, which is signed by every student when, before they enter classes on their freshman year. Uh, number six uh, of the statement of responsibility is social dancing is prohibited, but after the student's activism, what happens to this statement? It turns into social dancing within a non-Christian context is prohibited, finally allowing people to go dance, not at the secular discos on the Sunset Strip, but to dance at the lighthouse, right, Christian clubs. Notice, too, the, the student newspaper announces the win. They often give a coupon as well. If you bring your student ID and the coupon, you get in for free that day, no cover charge that day. I also think the phrasing of the students when they write in about how happy they are, that one of the students writes, um, I'm finally coming out as a dancer. I just thought that was really funny, right? <laughs> Anyways. Um, now, only one of the Christian nightclubs currently in my study uh, do I find actually banned dancing, never allowed dancing in its premises. And that was that former uh, you know, celebrity Rodeo Drive disco, The Daisy. Also, this is proof, uh, just this picture of me doing photographic research is just from my chair to prove that I was working during the pandemic, right? Um, but I was looking at UCLA trying to find photographs of, uh, of Christian nightclubs. I finally find this photograph of The Daisy here. And I want to point out, even though there's no dancing here, which I think is quite odd, um, I want to point out not all people are angry about it. 14-year-old Cindy Huff, who used to go to the Daisy all the time, says, it's just nice coming to the Daisy and just listening to the words of the music, right? Um, and plus, she says, I can always go to other uh, Christian nightclubs if I really wanted to dance. I like a place where it's not expected for me to dance, right? Um, but what does the Daisy owner have to say about why he doesn't allow dancing in his premise? He says, or at least the manager, he says, dancing would hinder what we do. We feel our job is to get out the gospel. We entertain, but that's not the main emphasis. And that is what's really interesting to me. Just how much an emphasis to place on evangelism was something that every Christian nightclub owner had to wrestle with. On one hand, these entrepreneurs wanted to build places of Christian fellowship to help spread what they saw was the loving message of Jesus Christ. But on the other hand, they wanted to compete against secular music clubs and, that were, and to be seen as hip, right? To them, if Christian nightclubs were nothing more than a church service at night, their venues would not be able to bring in Christian clientele who, fell, who found church service boring and banal. They also feared that too churchy of a, a dance club would scare away non-Christians who were drawn to the club not because of its religious under, undertones, but for its clean atmosphere, a.k.a. no booze, no smoking, right? And in the end, these nightclub owners wanted their clubs to be fun, so any sort of evangelism had to be tempered, right? But I want to point out, only a few of California's Christian nightclubs had direct connection to actual churches, but that does not mean that there's no evangelism going on. For example, at the basement at 10 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays, the DJ at the basement would turn off the music just for a few minutes, three minutes maybe max, and let a group prayer. And he, one of the prayers, when the press was there, he asked God to deliver jobs to the unemployed people of Orange County, and he asked God to bring elusive rain to drought-ridden California, right? A very different era, right? Um, after reading a few words of scripture, the music returned, and so did the dancing. And that was the extent of evangelism at the at the basement, right? As the basement owner said, we are not a church. We are not attempting to be a church, but we have many kids who have given their hearts to Christ because of our little three-minute service, right? 17-year-old Kami Simpson enjoyed the Daisy in Los Angeles precisely because it was not a church. She says, it's more alive and fun than going to a church. Cindy Huff said, at church, I have to be careful what I say because it might hurt the old people, the young people, the children. Here at this nightclub, you don't have to worry about a offending anyone because everyone is always smiling, right? Now, while Christian nightclubs uh, often had spaces for praying and counseling, they were often on the sides of these bars or in a, in a back room or maybe outside. They rarely were in the bar area or certainly not in the dance floor area, right? In fact, some Christian nightclubs um, uh, were made sure not to comp compete with church or church functions. For, for example, most of the seven nightclubs in my study do not have, um, do not allow people to come on Sundays 
or Wednesdays, right? Wednesday nights, traditional church activity nights. Now, the evangelical light atmosphere at Christian nightclubs appealed to adults, too. The management at the Daisy saw its location on Rodeo Drive um, next to bustling nightclubs as a different vehicle for spreading the gospel, targeting those who were uninterested in coming to Sunday services, right? Following the opening night performance at the Praises nightclub, the owner appealed appeal to his nightclub patrons, patrons for a quick talk, and he opened by saying, I'm not going to have you all lower your heads and raise your hands for this. This isn't a church, but, but I'd be cheating you if I didn't give you the opportunity to meet Jesus. It was only a five-minute exercise, and they went back to dancing and listening to music, right? Now, I mentioned earlier that Christian nightclubs often didn't aesthetically seem very different from, uh, from secular nightclubs, but I do want to mention that the decor often uh, really did make Christian nightclubs seem distinct. Some of my students talked about seeing Christian uh, uh, wall art, right? That, that's part of it. For example, secular nightclubs rarely hung up small ecumenical flags like the Christian flag all around their, their nightclubs. Uh, basement DJ Craig Harold of The Basement, um, uh, he, he uh, DJed from a booth with a large portrait of Jesus behind his right shoulder. There's a very famous portrait uh, by Richard uh, Hook called the Head of Christ with a large Christian cross hanging behind his other soldier, so, shoot, so shoulder. Nightclub owners often left out religious literature. They would leave out Christian newspapers, uh, small psalm books, old Bibles, uh, Christian newsletters and what, whatnot. As one owner said of the basement, we don't push the literature on them, but we make it available. Some Christian nightclubs had wall art. They had sayings uh, uh, painted on the wall like, where charity and love are, there is God. Or, we are one in Christ, let us love one another. Even the bathrooms were not without a Christian touch. They often had bathroom signs that did not say men and women. And we want to guess what they said? Brothers and sisters, right? They had spiritual food for sale, right? Um, Christian nightclubs may have mimicked secular clubs, but decor often marked visibly distinct Christian evening spaces. Well, let's get to the gritty stuff now. Let's talk about some of the taboos at Christian nightclubs. Um, smoking was banned or highly discouraged at every single one of the Christian nightclubs in California. They often, uh, Christians often believe smoking to be overly indulgent, addictive, and ungodly, and they went out of their way to make these spaces free of lit tobacco, with the right on hoping that its patrons would only have, quote, spiritual highs inside their, um, their space, right? And by the way, this is, not that, um, this is not that shocking to us. By the 1970s, smoking is, I know, slowly happening, but slowly on the decline um, into the 1970s as deferential health and addiction data becomes much more understood by the American public. Um, but I want to point out, this is a draw for many, especially non-Christians, going to Christian nightclub spaces. As one of the owners of Orange County's Christian nightclub says, probably one of the main drawing cards we have is that we are a smoke-free atmosphere. A lot of people come in here who aren't even Christians just to escape that awful stench of cigarettes. Right, which is by a far cry. In the 1920s, a majority of Americans say cigarette smoke is a pleasing fragrance. Right, so a reminder to us that smoke, uh, sorry, uh, smell is a is historically contingent. Right, but what is the one thing, uh, the one thing that unites all Christian nightclubs? Anyone want to guess the one kind of taboo that is completely banned at every Christian nightclub? alcohol, right? Absolutely no booze, right? That's the most striking difference between secular spaces and Christian bars. There's absolutely no booze here, which we kind of make sense. Protestants are the driving force behind the late 19th century temperance movement. And while ma- many Protestants still drink throughout much of the 20th century, including in this era, a belief that alcohol could lead to unwise decisions and eventually sin leads many evangelicals to embrace tetalism in the later part of the 20th century. As one Christian a nightclub owner tells uh, a newspaper, some Christian young people are go dancing at the only places available to them, secular clubs, places where liquor is served. Some of them might even get a little smashed themselves and then go home and have a guilt trip. And then entrepreneurs then at Christian nightclub saw a godly mission to create a dancing space where Christians could experience nightlife on their own terms without any booze and its ability to lower the inhibitions of God's warriors. Um, now, just because there's no booze does not mean there's no bars. In fact, every, every single uh, nightclub that I, I study here in the 1970s and 80s has a bar. They often didn't call it a bar. Sometimes they called it a bar. For instance, one of the, uh, the ways they called uh, their bar space, they call it a Jacob's Well. Um, and this is a place, um, this is a reference to when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman and offers her um, living water, right? But it wasn't just water being offered at these clubs. We had non-alcoholic drinks like 7-Up and Punch and Cherry Coke and 
root beer, pineapple juice. Um, but to make their drink menus not seem like roller uh, skating uh, concession stands, um, they often also included frothy cocktails, as they called them, right? Uh, fantastic frothy, frothy cocktails. One of these uh, that was popular on many Christian uh, nightlife menus was the Promised Land, which was a cocktail of milk and honey. Uh, other famous ones were Samson's Delight, Happy Halo, Fruit of the Spirit, Carpenter's Quencher, all likely takes on margaritas and Mai Tais just without the alcohol, or as the Santa Ana Press calls it, rum drinks without the rum, right? Um, and they often tasted like the real thing, according to Santa Ana, right? Um, and by the way, this was uh, the idea of making a non-alcoholic space appeal to Christians uh, was actually a, a man named Jason Ross who would eventually open up Praises Nightclub in Los Angeles in the 1980s. Um, he, he really got the idea that you can bring in more people by having no alcohol. But when he rented out a space before he opened up his bar, he rented out a space in Los Angeles for a Christian music night. And the Muslim staff who was working at that space that night came up to him, according to Ross, and said, we just love listening to music, but also not having to be pressured by alcohol being in the space. And so many of these Christian entrepreneurs figured they can bring in more people, even non-Christians, if they can create a clean, no alcohol space, right? Um, a non-drinking market was possible to these men. Now, the clientele of Christian nightclub, these Christian nightclub experiences was predominantly younger people, but nightclub owners initially really hoped, really, really hoped that it was all adults who would show up, um, at least an over-18 crowd, hoping their nights could serve as places to facilitate Christian romance and Christian dating. For example, Hal Rupert, who opened up several Orange County Christian nightlife spaces, um, he once said that on any given weekend, there are 50,000 Christian singles just in Orange County needing a place to dance. The single adult, according to Rupert, is the most neglected person in the church. And so what does he do? Um, he creates what he calls a video vision dating service. He gets dozens and dozens of Christian women that come to his, uh, his dance club. He records them. This is not that weird. He records them in the club, and he asks them questions like, what do you like? What do you don't like in a guy? And these are recorded on, on, on tape, and then men can watch them who also go to the club. And then Rupert and his, and his club organizers will match men and women together and and where do you guys guess the number one date spot is going to be for this, these new couples? The nightclub itself, right? A way to get people to come to the nightclub, right? Now, Rupert claims that he's, he set up 300 couples, but I have no evidence that that's actually true. So, But apparently it was somewhat successful, right? Now, Christian nightclub owners hope their sites could appeal to adults and also families, right? Um, you know, dancers at Newport Beach's Lighthouse One um, liked the clean experience they had. Um, one 23-year-old named uh, Mary Jade said, I come here with my sister. We've even thought about asking mom and dad to come occasionally. Can you imagine? taking mom and dad uh, to a mom and dad night at a secular bar, right? This is a place that you can actually have fun with your parents, right? Now, I also have some early evidence that Christian nightclubs also become sites of teaching uh, where men and, and learning, I should say, where men and women got experience on how to think about romance and respect in accordance with their faith and away from societal uh, secular expectations. Are evangelical singles allowed to openly flirt? Are they allowed to make eye contact? Are they allowed to touch while they're dancing on a dance floor in a so-called Christian context? And another major, major reason why so many evangelical adults want the Christian nightclub scene to succeed is to be able to find romantic partners outside the confines of their individual churches. Sure, there are plenty of fish in the sea at these mega churches that they go to, but there's initially a feeling of promise that Christian nightclubs could expand the scope of Christian social lives. Another way of thinking about this is evangelical adults think that Christian nightclubs can be places where they can make friends outside the church. Sure, with other Christians, a good thing, right? But away from their own church, where they spend so much of their time already, right? So really important, the main goal of these evangelical bars is to create a Christianized version of secular bars. To owner Jason Ross at Praises, right, even though he lets all people of all ages come in, he doesn't want youth to come in initially, right? He thinks that they already have enough youth-centered youth programs at churches. There's, there's uh, youth music festivals taking place at Knott's Berry Farm and Disneyland. He wants his Praises nightclub to compete with secular bars, right? And alas, though... Kids come and they dominate these Christian spaces, right? Um, young people are not so much, we're not so much focused on religious overtones of, the, of these Christian nightclubs. They went to them because it was often the only place they could get in. The, the drinking age, the, the bar age in California, I believe, is 21, despite most states having an 18 year old uh, age policy at the time. They, many of them don't have fake IDs, but it's a place to go dance, a place to hang out outside of your house, which makes sense, right? 
And this wasn't a huge deal. Many Christian entrepreneurs wanted their bars to be help kids get off the street, as they called it, and reject the temptations of smoking and drinking and premarital sex. Um, Hal Rupert of those OC bars, he once said that his bars, about 20% of them are about teenagers. The rest of them are probably adults or older um, uh, or younger adults, but only about 20% of our teenagers who have no place to go, he says. Now, teenagers are not the most orderly of patrons. Um, The basement's owner, for instance, laments that teens have taken over the basement. Even though there are separate dance floors for teens and adults, often there would be no adults and teens would just kind of run amok inside um, his his bar. Police reports at the time allege that teens are committing vandalism, public urination, binge drinking, public sex, marijuana use, either around the club or like outside on the parking lot, right? It's teenagers being teenagers, right? Um, And so several bar owners learn from these these, these kind of youth... uh, uh, these, these rowdy teenagers about what not to do when they open up new clubs. For example, Hal Rupert, when he opens up his second nightclub, uh, the, the Noah's Ark, uh, yes, Noah's Ark, he doesn't allow people to exit without repaying their cover charge. And young people are stingy, right? So they're often not going to leave because he's worried about kids leaving, going to the parking lot, drinking with their friends, having sex in vehicles, smoking pot, and then trying to come back in. This is one way that Rupert's able to keep people out, right? Now, I, wanted, I don't want to suggest that all young people ignore the Christian purpose of, uh, and, and mission of evangelical bars, right? While many teenagers saw Christian nightclubs as an opportunity to be typical teenagers, others really did value the space as a religious space. Um, for Bible school students, right, they enjoyed the clean music. Um, they finally got to find a club they can relate to. Many homeschool Christian kids, it was at, at these Christian nightclubs where the first time they learned how to dance, disco dance for the first time, right? They got to meet other kids um, who were going to public schools or religious schools that they did not go to, right? Um, as, uh, as one st- youngster said when they went to right on nightclub, I love this club because it's righteous for people like me who like to go stag. Um, the best part of Lighthouse One in Newport Beach, according to 17-year-old Joanne Young, was that you know what to expect here. You don't have to be cautious because you know the other people share your set of values. Pretty uh, precocious young children, right? Um, young loved not feeling peer pressure about sex or drugs or smoking or booths. She wanted to hang out with her friends clear-headed. And by the way, these nightclubs are also romantic zones for teenagers as well. Um, As one college student who went to the basement all the time said, I had never seen so many foxes gathered in one place before. Three 14-year-old girls who were interviewed by the OC Register said they liked going because of the positive energy at at, at these nightclubs, the great music, the fun dance floor, but we really go to meet good-looking boys, right? Now, as I'm closing up here, one question that I had about this, because I I told you I had all these preconceived notions about Orange County conservatives or Orange County evangelicals. I was questioning how diverse are these bars, right? Are there people of color inside them? What does diversity mean here? Especially because in the early part of my research, I found a a book by a theologian named Donald uh, McGavran, who who was was all, a book's all about how to expand your congregation as an evangelical in the 1970s. And this is what he said. Churches have to respect the fact that people like to become Christians without crossing racial, linguistic, or class barriers here, right? What does he mean by that? He's like, it makes sense that most Christian uh, spaces, especially churches, are going to be homogenous. And yet I don't actually see that in these Christian nightclub spaces. Um, The press, when they go to the the non-dancing bar, the Daisy on Rodeo Drive, they often talk about the audience of 200 to 300 people being half black, half white. This is the 70s. so it's a racial binary understanding, right? Um, The New York Times calls the Daisy having, having a variety of ethnic and age groups who attend. And it's not just racial diversity that I'm talking about here. Um, No Ark, for example, creates permanent nights, not one off, one day a month, permanent nights, I think it's every Tuesday night, where it's really geared towards senior citizens. They play 1940s swing music for senior citizens to have fun at Noah's Ark. And Hal Rupert, who starts Noah's Ark, uh, realizes that all if he adds a couple of, of ramps, this is way before the Americans with Disability Acts, he can have a permanent night, uh, well, he can all, every single night, but also one day of the week as well, invite people um, with disabilities to come in and dance on his dance floor. And he makes sure people knows that. He, he puts ads in, in the local uh, school press, again, targeting young people too, like CSU LA's newspaper, come to our place. It is wheelchair accessible before many secular bars are ever going to be wheelchair accessible, right? So uh, at least somewhat commitment to diversity here. As I close here, 
Christian nightclubs seemed exciting to many folks, especially in the early weeks of the open. Um, I told you there were lines outside of Right On, the place where we began our lecture today um, on their opening year. The Daisy's 300 seats were constantly filled on Friday nights in the late 70s. A thousand patrons would pack into Noah's Ark from bow to stern, as they called it on some weekends. In the 1980s, Lighthouse One was probably, according to the press, Orange County's largest dance club. Um, And yet... Almost all of these Christian nightclubs, all seven of these Christian nightclubs in this study um, fold relatively quickly. None of the seven uh, nightclubs discussed today survived more than a few years. Now, most businesses have financial difficulties in their early years, but this was especially true for Christian nightclubs. Why? What could they not rely on to bring in money? Alcohol, right? Booze is the number one thing to bring in money. My nightlife students already know that. They're nodding their head, right? There's no booze money coming in. So you have to make it up in other ways. You can charge cover charges, which every single nightclub that I study has a cover charge. It's often double the cover charge of secular clubs trying to make up for lost income, which is why kids are not going to pay the double uh, 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 cover charge to get back in. Some, like the days, are going to have membership programs, but they don't, they don't really take off. You can sell food and drink, but you're not making a lot of money with 50 cent hot dogs, right? Um, staff is often not as being paid meager wages if they're making any wage. Often these Christian nightclubs, I told you, they're not church affiliated, but they often ask for volunteers to work there on the weekend, right? Um, so they're not able to overcome these financial challenges because they're not making a lot of money. Also, they're in, I told you, they're in prime locations. They're in Rodeo Drive. Rodeo Char- Drive is charging the Daisy $10,000 a month for rent, right? So these, these nightclubs almost seem doomed to fail. Um, Now, before I close, I want to think about a question that uh, was offered to me by um, my brilliant department colleague, Dr. Allison Konoski, earlier today um, when I was talking about today's lecture. She asked me, what do I think was lost when these evangelical nightclubs failed to become a permanent part of American nightlife landscape? And it's a fabulous question and one that I want to explore further as this project develops. But I see this desire to build a Christian nightlife space as a way for evangelicals to validate their lifestyles within secular America. The evangelical explosion in California seemed like uh, uh, it could have floated these Christian nightclubs for a little bit longer, but their inability to survive suggests at least, at least for a few years, suggests a less than receptive long-term evangelical audience. For one, despite the hopes that these nightclubs might provide entertainment for mostly adult evangelicals, mostly young people turned out, and these young people had thin billfolds, right? These younger crowds likely turned away older single Christians who wanted a more adult space. It's possible, too, that Christian nightclubs could not get over the stigma as sanitized and uncool compared to their secular nightlife alternatives. Yes, there was the temptations of drugs and sex and, and, and booze at, at secular nightclubs, but Christians can easily just say no, as the First Lady was instructing them to do in the 1980s, right? The opening excitement of all these nightclubs eventually dissipates, and so does the patrons. Entrepreneurs hope that these nightclub experiments might bring about a newfound Christian evening pleasure culture. They hope that Christian nightclubs might offer evangelicals an alternative space to enjoy the pleasure of nightlife. Evangelical spots uh, that they can listen to good music, hang with their friends, and dance with one another. And these nightclubs could perhaps keep Christians excited about Christ at all hours of the day, not just on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. But in the end, a Christian nightclub scene was not all that viable and certainly was not sustainable. This is why we don't live in a world where Christian nightclubs are everywhere. Even when Christian nightclubs open up in cities like Houston and Dallas and Atlanta and New York um, in, in cities, they're often they're, the, the, the wider press often covers them. They have a major news story. And the reason why the major press covers them is because they're a novelty, right? And they seem to fold within a year. They often don't even make um, a Yelp because they're only there for a couple of weeks. We should ask ourselves how this affects evangelical culture going forward because the evangelical mission doesn't end. It just doesn't manifest in a way that Christian nightclub entrepreneurs ultimately hope for. Excuse me, hope for. I want to end with the Christian nightclub that we started off in line in 1971. Following that performance that we all waited in line for, the evangelical crowd all goes home. They go home to their homes in Los Angeles. Many of them go home to West Covina and the suburbs of Orange County. But bar hopping was a very common scene on the Sunset Strip, and surely a few drunks uh, who were bar hopping down the Sunset Strip on that night likely stopped inside the club around midnight, and inside they saw the nightclub was completely empty, not just free from smoke and booze, but from patrons too. The bar, the bar hoppers probably looked around and noticed that no beer was being sold. They promptly left 
but unbeknownst to them, they had entered perhaps the Strip's most unique venue that night, one of a series of California nightlife experiments that tried to show the evangelical belief that Jesus made happy days and happy nights. To these California evangelicals, the day thou givest the Lord might have ended, but the night with his godly nightclubs was another opportunity to praise him. Thank you very much. I would be, I would be honored to take any questions that we have. Or do my best to answer any questions that we have. Yes. Did you see any, like, newspaper articles that talked about, like, homosexual dancing or, like, same-sex dancing? Because I would think that that would cause, like, a stir in the nightclub, but I don't know if it actually happened because of the environment. Sure. One of the shocking things you actually, what I, one of the things that shocked me is that I don't find a lot of what we think about, especially the Christian right. I don't want to say that all evangelicals are part of the Christian right. I want to point that out very quickly, right? But at least I grew up in the middle of evangelical America and Missouri and Indiana and whatnot. And I was expecting some of these nightclubs to come out and say, you know, no same sex hand holding or all this kind of stuff, right? Or, you know, all this literature being about anti abortion. You hardly see any social issues being discussed. Arthur Blazett does tell people what is he entering the bars in the 1960s. Um, um, you know, homosexuality is wrong, but that's about the only thing I see so far in my research. We don't see a connection between these nightclubs and the promotion of social issues that we often tie the Christian right to. So, no, I, I see very little evidence of that, yeah. which is surprising. Yeah, Sully. Um, you kind of mentioned it at the end there, but did you find that these clubs in, like, their heyday would match the hourly schedules of the secular bars? Like, would they be... I don't know if it was 2 a.m. back then for, like, you know, the typical time, but would it be 2 a.m.? Could it be later even? That's a good question. Um, I have – so it depends what kind of venue. So Right On was mostly a live music venue, so they would actually play a performance and everyone went home, kind of that kind of thing. Um, some of them stayed open on the exact hour, so they closed at closing time, I think at 1 or 2 a.m. in the 1970s. Um, sometimes they would close if no one ever showed up. This tends to be – they would close early when – at the end of their run, right, when evangelicals are not going to these clubs. But certainly the ones that are catering to young people, college students, the Lighthouse, in Newport Beach, that is staying open as late as it can. Um, so yeah, they are often trying to mirror the secular clubs. And this is kind of the point, right? Lighthouse is geared towards college students, and they want college students to go there and not go to the, the secular bars, right? But yes, totally. Yes? Um, with these entrepreneurs, because we find sometimes that entrepreneurs' values or not will just jump on it like, this seems like something we can make money on. So did you, have you found any research about what these club owners went on to after their uh, spaces closed? Like, did they stay in nightlife or did they move on to other religious ventures? You know, Hal Rupert, who is the owner of the, a couple of these Orange County ones, and I was dying to do research on him. Uh, and I think he, I believe, I don't want to call someone dead and they're not be dead, but um, I believe he passed away uh, during the pandemic in 2020, and I was like, darn, I could have interviewed him right before that. Um, but it seems like this, most of these entrepreneurs have a lot of money, so they're able, so even though these are, they're not successful enterprises, they're not, you know, devastated by their, um, their financial loss of these clubs. Many of them become, uh, they're, they, they go into other businesses, but I, if, the question is, I think what you're trying to suggest, are they actually men of faith? And I, I say men of faith because I don't have any evidence that any of these are women. Um, I, I question that too, and my students all know that capitalism is a driving force of much of the nightlife that we talked about. Even colonial taverns are, are run by capitalists, right? Um, but I get a sense that these men are actually, they, they're men of the faith, right? They believe in um, the message of God. Now, they often disagree with some of the fundamentalists. They disagree with Jerry Falwell. They, just, they may disagree with uh, Jim Baker, but they believe in spreading evang- um, evangelical Christianity because many of them are saved, right? Many of them were going to the bars in, in their youth and found them uh, to be uh, malicious places, right? So they wanted to share the, the coming of God, the pleasures of God with the rest of the world and the youth of the world. And so especially how Rupert and some of these other ones in Orange County, I believe them. They, they, they believe what they are saying. Yeah. And it's also not bad to make a buck on it sometimes, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please, back here. I have a couple quick questions. Hello. First of all, wonderful talk. Thank, Thank you for sharing this. I really appreciate uh, getting a whole different uh, spin on many different issues here. Um, first, the, the, the satirical piece you read about rounding them up. Um, well, did you find evidence that there were actually people being busted and having to pay the fine? And I think we were just wondering, well, how did that work? Who busted them? Were they ratted out by other people? Or was there a... 
monitor who would check the clubs to see if any of the students were out there? I mean, I'm just sort of curious. Sure. That's a great question. So I don't have any evidence that the university is sending spies or anything like that to the White House or something like that. Um, but I do see I have evidence. I have letters being sent to uh, the newspapers of people being upset that they're, they got letters. So someone has routed them out. Their friends, maybe the university is sending out there, but I don't have evidence of that. I don't want to accuse Vanguard University of doing anything uh, terrible, right? Uh, but I don't have evidence of that. I will say, though, many of the liberal college students who are complaining about this dancing ban, they compare this to other bans that other Christian universities or churches have banned in the past. Um, church, they, they said the church has changed their mind about women's makeup, about women wearing shorts, too. Like They see this as a, the next logical thing to end. They, they feel like much of the handbook should be removed, right? And dancing is the most logical one, especially because they can do it in a, quote, Christian context, right? They're not asking to go to Studio 54 here. They're asking to go to a place with no smoking, no booze, right? Um, and so, uh, but no, I have no evidence that the these, they're being regulated like that. So. Okay. And my other question is kind of moving things forward a little. Sure. It seems to me, and I may be wrong here, that the decline of the Christian nightclubs might coincide with the rise of the sort of mega churches that have like rock bands and a much hipper kind of vibe, you know, like... And survive. Those survive. Yeah, and I'm wondering if if one kind of drew from the other, if maybe the clubs declined because mega churches were offering something that was a little more substantive, even if it wasn't at night, but I don't know, is there any connection, you think, between one and the other? Very possible. I don't know. That's a great question, uh, and I think one of the ways of thinking about that is going back to the point that several people hope that, at least I'm talking about patrons, not the owners themselves, several people are happy about this because they're not having to go see the same people they see at their mega church. And by the way, these mega churches can be you know, thousands of people, so it's not like you're seeing the same people over, over time, but you know, if you feel like you've, you've, you've gone to many of these functions at the mega churches and you can't find a romantic date that's 21 and you're 21, like, you want to find Christians from other places, and this is what the allure of, like, what bars are. Right now, people can go to the same bars over and see the same people at the same time, but many people are excited that they're going to see people outside their church networks. But I think that's a good example. With When you talk about what Dr. Konoski was asking earlier, like, what do we lose when we don't have a permanent Christian nightlife space? Maybe we lose uh, evangelicals being able to, uh, you know, make contact with other Christians in their local communities. They're only going to these Christian rock festivals. These these festivals that their own churches are putting on, right? Um, so maybe it's a replacement. I'm not trying to suggest that or, or not suggest that, but I do think there is some, it's, there, it is interesting that it does not take off because of this huge explosion and because Christians are able to sustain banks and summer camps and all these other things. Why they're not able to succeed in nightclubs is an enigma. Mm-hmm. Yes, please. I have a connected question. Sure. Do you have any evidence on? how they are actually socializing uh, at night. I mean, are they in their dorms? What are the young adults doing, college students and adults? Are they socializing in some spaces outside their family? Or is it very family-oriented, in which case this this moves against that in some way, and that's why that's it fails. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I haven't thought about that. You're, you're talking about within their church. Like, are they socializing across, like, age boundaries? No, I'm any space. Oh, in other that's... words, take the three groups, it seems to me, you've looked at college students. Yeah. Well, you, you have people before college, but sure. college students, young adults, and then a little older adult. Mm-hmm. Where are they socializing? Outside, you mean outside the nightclubs or even inside the nightclubs? Yeah, well, uh, the nightclubs fail, so they're sure. socializing oh, right. some other place. <laughs> sure. Do you have any evidence where that might be? Sure. I mean, the number one place is the home, right? That's the number one where most people are making contact with people that are older than them or younger than them. Um, and also at these these mega churches in Orange County, they are age segregated in some ways too, right? Um, they're, they're going to church together, but it's often Christian, there's services for younger people. There are services for younger, younger people, right? Um, and many of these are age segregated, so we don't have a lot of communication across that. So that's why I think that, that we, I have some evidence that some people want to go to a, a nightlife spot with their parents. Is so such a weird thing, um, but no, I, I don't. I haven't thought about where outside of nightclubs are people actually where older uh, Christians and younger Christians are hanging out. That's something I should definitely look into. Yes, John, please. Eric, I'm wondering about who else might have gone to these clubs mm. to meet good-looking guys. <laughs> uh, to and I, Jim Baker is just one reminder that there is an overlap between your studies of, of queer culture and, and nightlife culture. Sure. 
the question sort of answers itself. I guess I'm, 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 in, I'm not very cleverly sneaking an answer into this question, but mm-hmm. to what extent, I wonder, were these clubs a gay way station? Uh, mm-hmm. I had an awful lot of students in the 1970s who were self-announced born-again Christians, but in the quiet of my office would talk about their gay yearnings. And there, this is totally anecdotal, but there is, I'm convinced there's, some, there's a connection there, that mm. a, lot of, a lot of people's first step in seeking some sort of nightlife expression, they might go to, down Hollywood Boulevard to a, to a Christian nightclub, but they might end up at Studio One a little mm-hmm. bit later sure. on. Sure, yeah. And that, so on, this on notion of a kind of stepping stone. On the same like night, you mean? That, that drew off some, you know, the gay clubs drew a lot of people away from the, the Christian nightclubs, too. Sure. That, that's very possible, too. I mean, also, do you go to a Christian nightclub because you don't, you don't have the expectation to, if you're a guy, to hit on women, right? So it's a place for queer men to go and know that, like, they can dance with other men. And uh, people are going to assume they're, they're heterosexuals, right? No one's going to assume automatically you're, you're a homosexual. And about the issue of whether they're going to... Uh, there's going to be policing of same-sex dancing. Sure. Some things don't even have to be expressed. Right. Sure. You just know you're not going to be, you're, you aren't going to be able to do that yeah. unless you're at Studio One or at, at, a, at an official gay club. Yeah. But shocking, I don't have any evidence. Like, no one has mentioned homosexual. Other, Arthur Blessed talks about, you know, gays are, uh, you know, are, are a problem, but not in connection with nightclubs. Like, why do I, 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 I'm just shocked they don't have people being like, we're going to, like, L- L- Jerry Falwell is unabashedly, I'm building a university to build God's warriors. I'm going to build a Supreme Court chamber to teach the next generation of lawyers to overturn Roe v. Wade. He succeeds in that effort, right? Why don't I see that in, in night, these nightclubs, right? Why don't I say, like, we're going to teach kids how to be proper heterosexual? Heterosexuals, or which is weird. It just seems very odd, and I've got to I've got to figure that out. Well, you know? I don't think in the seventies it was being recognized yet as a. Pro- it's during the AIDS crisis that people start sure. realizing, gee, there really are queer Americans, aren't there? And <laughs> yeah. they're dying at, at yeah. a rapid rate. That's true. But in the seventies, it was the great, un- you know. Uh, yeah, but I went to Brian. Studio One. There were there were there was quite a clientele there, yeah. but it was not widely recognized by anybody else. Yeah, that's true. I just think Nia Bryant's out by 78. Like, and there are, these nightclubs are in 78-ish. So, I don't know. It's a good question, though. Other questions? Maybe one or two more. Yes, please. Give one second. I'm going to wait for the mic. Over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that one of the things that were lost because of those nightclubs shutting down was opportunities for Christians to meet other Christians outside of their own churches. Um, did, did they also lose opportunities to meet secular people or non-religious people and do you think that might have caused an impact later on in terms of like distance or ideological divides uh, because they couldn't you know see each other's perspectives and reach an understanding or was the impact not that drastic that's very possible yeah i actually don't know that that's a great suggestion and one of the other things to remember too is that Christian nightclubs steal patrons initially from bars that are, are, cl- are clean but without Christian context, right? I told you that to me it was shocking that Christian nightclubs don't copy the coffee house circuit. They don't think of themselves as coffee crew because there are many Christian coffee houses. But many of the Christian nightclubs uh, say that we are inspiration from going to clean clubs, non-religious clubs, but clubs that did not serve alcohol, clubs that were popular with AA members or, or Muslims or Protestants who didn't like, – but it wasn't a Christian club. There was no ecumenical flags waving. There's no you know, pictures of Jesus anywhere. And so many of these clubs, even in Orange County, are upset when these Christian nightclubs come out because they lose business because all of the people who used to go to them are finally going to these Christian nightclubs. So that's a great question. I, I'm curious if I'm not trying to say that if, if, if there was a gigantic uh, evangelical Christian nightlife scene, we'd be living in a very different political time. But you do wonder if, if you limit the ability. It, it, it's an, it's uh, admirable that, I, I don't know if it's admirable, but it's interesting uh, to think about what these nightclubs meant for these Christians. Right? They're trying to make in roads into these secular communities and when they're gone do they lose that ability to make connections with secular people and whatnot that's that's a very interesting question i don't have a great answer for that but i'll look into it well thank you all very much thank you thanks for listening to c-span's lectures and history podcast if you're interested in hearing more history check out season two of the presidential recordings podcast 
The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.